Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery Programming Series for our current exhibition, Arts Beacon of Light, curated by Katie Monahan. Today, we are thrilled to present artist Terry Kern. As a brief reminder, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode. Please feel free to utilize that chat function and ask questions. We'll be sure to get to them during the Q&A portion of the hour. Next, live captioning is available and you can access that by clicking on the closed caption icon. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth. So if one of us freezes up or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for sticking with us, we will carry through. And um, all right, I think that's it. Thank you everyone for being here with us. And now to you, Terry. Great, thanks so much, Kat. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be Indiana Jones, archaeologist, adventurer, explorer. I found myself uh, fascinated with objects, objects that held their own histories and objects that told their own stories. Well, fast forward 40 plus years, and while I didn't become an archaeologist, I did become an artist, and now I create my own objects, objects that hold my history and objects that tell my story. And I'm here today to share a little bit of that with you. So thank you so much for your interest in my work. Um, people are always asking me like, gosh, where do you get your ideas from? What are your visual influences? So I'm gonna share a little bit about that with you now. Uh, when I was a kid, I really did not like to read. I wasn't a great student. So my mom introduced me to fairy tales, Grimm's fairy tales, Anderson's fairy tales. And while the fairy tales were cool, what was even cooler were the illustrations that went along with them. Woodcuts, etchings, lithographs, they were really like interesting, organic, detailed, and a little bit sinister. I also had a thing for Vikings, I don't know why, um, and Viking interest led to interest in their maps, which led to an interest in old maps overall. And one of the things I loved about old maps were all the details and the little paintings within the larger map. And in fact, if you look at my work that's in the exhibition now, there are small paintings located within the larger paintings that grace the surfaces of my pieces. Um, I was raised Catholic, so spent a lot of time in church looking at stained glass windows, illuminated manuscripts, illustrations in the Bible, and a lot of medieval art. And I love medieval art. It's kind of my jam. Everybody's like a little awkward and everybody's flat and there's a lot of black line, black outlines. And in my work today, I still outline everything in black. Uh, when we were kids, we were members of the Cincinnati Zoo, the Art Museum, the Natural History Museum. And I'm not saying it's because of that, but we didn't have a lot of money left over, over for vacation. So we went camping a lot at national campgrounds. So animals and nature feature really heavily in my work because that was a lot of my childhood was spent in the woods or at the zoo or working with different animals. We had all kinds of pets when I was a kid. I am one of three sisters. Uh, they call us Irish, Irish triplets because we were all born within a four year period of time. And that means that we were all in high school together. I mean, talk about sibling rivalry. Um, my older sister, Lisa is on the left. I always jokingly say that she popped out of the womb with her 4.0 grade average. Um, she's really hard worker. She's very smart and she's a doctor now living out West. And on the right is my younger sister, Patty. Um, she was born with an old soul. She has compassion, empathy, and a great sense of humor. And she's also went into the science field. She's a nurse working uh, in research, helping uh, uh, create clinical trials for people with cancer. And I was that kid in the middle, uh, not super great at school, always grounded and not very popular. Um, but somehow in art class, the things that I came up with using my imaginations and the skills with my hands, I created things that make people go like, wow, that's pretty cool. So I did get positive feedback from being in art class and that really had a lasting effect on me. Um, by the time I went, went to college, here's my old friend, Indiana Jones, i.e. he's in my top five husband list. Um, just kidding. Um, I really wanted to study archeology. span So I took took earth science and anthropology and uh, sociology, but I found them to be so much more boring than the Indiana Jones movies that I decided to focus on art instead. And this is one of my pieces from college, um, thrown on the wheel, carved in relief, and then pit fired. It, it actually looks like it could have been dug up out of the ground. Um, I, like most people, um, wanted to do something that I love with my hands, so I kind of focused on clay. And um, 
I had just learned how to throw on the wheel. I was a sophomore in college and throwing did not come easy to me. Uh, it, may, it, it took me the entire semester to really learn how to center, but it didn't stop me for applying for a job. Um, Joyce Clancy is the person that's pictured with me on the right. And she was the person that gave me my first real job in ceramics. Uh, I applied for a job looking for a experienced thrower. Um, so I went in and um, the job interview was just to sit down and throw. But of course, I was terrible at it. I had just learned how to do it and I couldn't even center the clay. And she took pity on me and she said, I'm gonna give you 10 minutes. And she walked out of the room and she came back and I had thrown this horrible cylinder. It was thick on one side and thin on the other. And she looked at me and she was like, you know what, kid, you can't throw, but I like you. You've got moxie. And she hired me not to throw on the wheel, but to sweep and mop the floor, to wedge clay and to mix up glazes. And the cool thing about working with Joyce is that all of her friends came to visit. They were professional potters, men and women that had their own studios, were making work, traveling around the country, selling them or selling their work through galleries. And it's just like Oprah Winfrey said, or maybe someone else said it too, if you can see it, you can be it. And seeing those men and women who made their living making things out of clay, I was like, yeah, that's my jam. That's what I want to do. And that's when I decided that I was going to become an artist. And when I went home to tell my mom and dad, I can tell you they were not especially thrilled. Uh, and that's when I decided that if I wanted them to take me seriously, I had to take myself seriously. So I wrote my first business plan in college. And by the, by the time I graduated, um, I had a wheel and a kiln and I rented studio space with two other artists for 45 bucks a month. And I started making and trying to sell this very unattractive jewelry. Uh, I call it my cow pie line. Uh, I liked it because it was brown and really earthy and kind of looked like bugs, but I couldn't sell it anywhere. So after several failed attempts at shows and doing some lectures and workshops, one of my friends that I met uh, through Joyce said, you know, why don't you go back to graduate school? And I was like, really? Uh, me, graduate school, two great things that don't go together. Um, but nevertheless, I decided to apply and not being great at academics, I did not take, uh, I did not apply for schools where you had to take the GRE, which is the graduate entrance exam. Um, and I got into three schools and I ended up going to Ohio University in Athens. Um, I love the idea of OU. It was about three hours away from home. Um, it was affordable and it was also known as a party school uh, because I did like to work really hard, but I also liked to party because I was a normal 20, you know, person in their 20s. Um, so when I got to graduate school, because I've had my own studio and, you know, done shows and had my own equipment, I thought I was like, you know, going to be like the one. But it turned out I was the youngest, most inexperienced person in my group of four first year graduate students. Um, this is the kind of work that I was making at the time. They were big, uh, natural looking forms, very soft and organic. And in graduate school, we had to produce finished work every three weeks. That means you made the clay, the glazes, you did your testing, you made your pieces, you fired them, and then you did a formal presentation, you painted sculpture stands, you painted the walls and you did like a gallery presentation of your work uh, to the professors and the other graduate students. And let me tell you, I had a very difficult first year. In undergraduate school, we focused mostly on technique, but in graduate school, they focused on concept. And that was really something that I wasn't familiar with. So let me just say that there was a lot of crying during my first year in graduate school um, and not just the professors, it was me as well. I'm, I'm kidding, they didn't cry at all, it was just me but it was mostly out of frustration. And during that first year in graduate school, I learned about the depth and breadth of art. I learned that art could be about the beauty of the natural world. Art can be about passion and relationships and love. It can be about things that are frightening or sinister or scary or anxiety provoking. It can be about fantasy and creating architectural spaces that transcend uh, the everyday world. Art can be about personal adornment and transformation. Art can be about love and loss and longing. So after multiple bad critiques, I remember sitting in my studio and my professor Chuck came in one day and he's like, what are you doing? I was like, I, I don't know. Like no matter what I do, no matter how I respond to your critiques, it's like, I can't do anything that you're pleased by or that you like. I was like, I don't even know what to make work about. And he looked at me and he said, make work about what you know. 
and he turned around and left. And I sat with that for a minute and I was like, what do I know? Well, I know that I was raised as a Catholic and that I should want to get married and have babies and raise a family. And I knew that that's not the life I wanted for myself. I knew that I wanted to forge my own path. I wanted to do something that was important to me, not to my religion, not to my family. And so that's when I decided that I was going to um, take a different path. And I had just done a research paper about Frida Kahlo. And for those of you who aren't familiar with her, you should really look her up. She's a Mexican surrealist painter. And she was in a terrible accident when she was a teenager and she had broke her spinal cord and her, and her pelvis. And as she was recuperating, she started painting her life, her suffering, her love, her sorrow, her successes, her failures, not just on her plaster cast and in the walls of her room and her bed frame, but on canvases. And I thought, you know, if Frida Kahlo is brave enough to document her personal history, I can have the courage to document mine. Um, so that's when I decided that was my path moving forward. I was going to document my personal experiences in my artwork, and that was what I wanted to talk about in my work. The other thing that I love Frida Kahlo was she felt very familiar to me. I was raised as a Catholic, and in the church that I grew up in, we had an over life size, hyper realistic sculpture of Jesus dying on the cross, full of blood and thorns and bodily fluids and misery. And so when I looked at her work, notice her, her thorny necklace cutting into her neck. Notice the kind of sinister quality of those little hands hanging from her ears. So I felt very comfortable with that kind of visual. It felt uh, like home to me in a way. So when I started making work after this, my work went from being these very large, um, uh, soft, natural looking pieces to being these very tiny prickly pieces. Um, because I didn't wanna get married and have babies, I was like, oh, why do I even have to have a period? And so I started to put bodily fluids in my work and my parents were freaking out and said, don't, don't ask anyone to your senior thesis show. We don't know what's going on, but we're a little worried. And, and I, that made me think like, gosh, if people don't wanna know about the concept behind my work, I should at least make the pieces that I'm making as beautifully crafted as possible. And, and one of the reasons my work got smaller and smaller was because I didn't want someone to be able to see my personal pain from all the way across the gallery um, because it was very painful. I love my family. And I felt, um, I felt some pain because I knew that I was disappointing them because I wanted to go and, and on my own road. I wanted to take my own path. Um, Needless to say, um, I kept crafting my pieces so, so that you could enjoy the visual craft, the Raku fired uh, parts of them. And, and that is kind of how I ended up having my graduate thesis. Um, my professor Chuck you know, said, I have to hand it to you, you were tenacious and you held on to what you wanted to do. And to me as an artist, that's what you have to do. If you have a passion for an idea or a concept or a technique, you have to hold on to that and not let anyone dissuade you. Certainly take criticism and change what you need to change to make your work more successful, but don't let anyone knock you off course. Um, after I got out of graduate school, I got a job at Burger King because I had to support myself and I wanted to continue to make artwork. So I was able to rent a studio space in Athens, Ohio, um, where I stayed after graduate school. And because I couldn't set up a clay studio, I started making these mixed media pieces. I had some handmade paper. I had a friend take some photographs of me and I used lacquer thinner to transfer those images to these pieces of paper. I went to the OU dumpster and pulled out telephone line and stripped the line and took out all the copper. And you can see that I've sewn like a veil over my self portrait here using copper wire. I also pulled out big pieces of cardboard and made these mixed media book constructions and a year after I got out of graduate school, I had an entire show of these pieces of mixed media uh, books. Um, and as an artist, it doesn't really matter. Maybe you can't work in your media, so you figure out a way to express yourself with some other media. And every time you do that and step out of your comfort zone, you're really evolving your work because now you've picked up new skills, new ways of looking at things. So I think that's really important for all artists to keep pushing themselves, whether you're taking a class or, or doing something different. Um, like most people with a master's degree, everybody kept saying, well, where are you going to teach? Where are you going to teach? And I really didn't want to be a teacher, but I felt compelled to go on interviews anyway. 
And my interview process was very similar to my critique process. There was crying involved. Yes, that's right. I actually did cry during the interview. Um, I'm just a very emotional person. But do I let that stop me from pursuing my goal? Absolutely not. You just pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and move forward. And while those kind of things, mistakes that happen, things that you regret are there, eventually they become a really funny story. Um, so I actually got a job teaching at Moorhead State University, and I made $7,000 a year there. I taught uh, every semester two sections of art appreciation and one section of intro to ceramics. And because I'm not academically gifted, I slept through most of my art history classes. So I was always uh, researching, borrowing slides from other faculty members to create these three hour long lectures every week for the art appreciation classes. Um, and because I was so poor, I was like, oh my gosh, I need to figure out a way to make more money. And a friend of mine said, well, why don't you buy underglaze and start you know, painting on pots and sell your own stuff? And I was like, you know, I can't paint. You know, uh, when I had my painting class in college, my professor, Sister Anne, told me I had no sense of color, but that I was really good at three-dimensional stuff. And I just, I, I, I can't paint. And she basically said, get over yourself. You're not in school anymore. You can do whatever you want. And so I started to paint on the surfaces of my pieces, uh, both dimensional and tile work. And I found that pretty soon I was making more money selling my work than I was teaching. I'm about 30 years old at this point. This is a little self-portrait of me. This is me throwing on the wheel late at night, dreaming of all the different kinds of pots uh, and shapes that I can throw on the wheel in that little bubble above my head. Um, so at 30, I wrote my second business plan and I gave myself 10 years. And I said, at the end of that 10 years, if I don't have a retirement account, a decent car and health insurance, I will quit trying to pursue art full time and get a job somewhere else and do art on the side. Um, lucky for me, uh, I never had to do that. I was able to kind of slowly build my business. Um, this is the kind of work that I was making. I moved back to Cincinnati. I shared a studio space with two other people. We each paid 100 bucks a month. And that's the studio space that I'm still in today. Uh, the other two people have long ago moved out and I just expanded into the space. And now I have this really nice studio in downtown Cincinnati. Um, this is the kind of work that I was making. Uh, one of the things that I inherited from graduate school was a really good critical eye. So I always look at my work and I'm always slightly disappointed because I can see everything that's wrong with it. And then I try and fix that on the next piece and on the next piece and on the next piece. The other thing that I inherited from my Catholic background was that modesty is very important. You're not supposed to brag about your work. You're not supposed to brag about how well you're doing. You're supposed to be very modest. So when I was trying to sell my work, all I could do was look at it and go, you know, the green part at the bottom didn't turn out as I planned. Uh, let me give you a 10% discount on that. Um, and that's how I was trying to sell my work. So obviously not doing a great job. I still had other uh, jobs at a ceramic supply house while I was making and selling my work. And one day during a studio sale, a guy came into my studio while I was giving my horrible sales pitch. And he's like, darling, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm selling my work. And he's like, no, you're not. You're giving it away. I'm going to teach you a little something I like to call the meet and greet. Roy was a used car salesman, and he taught me about sales. He said, somebody comes into your studio, you introduce yourself. You say, hey, my name's Terry Kern. Welcome to my studio. Make yourself at home. Look around. Don't, feel, don't be afraid to, to pick anything up. And he said, as soon as someone picks up one of your pieces, you walk on over. You talk to them about how you made it. The idea behind the piece, make sure you point out any special features, like I always paint a little something on the bottom of my pieces, you know, give them a story because sales is all about, number one, someone liking an object, whether it's a car or a, a mug. Number two, they have to like you. And if they like both things, then they're more prone to buy your work because not only do they have this thing you've made, they've got this really great story about this quirky artist they met. He told me to go home and practice every day for about 20 minutes until it felt natural to just talk about my work. And that is some of the best advice I've ever gotten. And it's advice I give to students when I talk to them. And from that point on, that really changed the trajectory of my career because I learned how to talk about my work. Um, while I'm doing all this stuff, working at a ceramic supply place, doing shows, I moved in with my mom and dad who lived with my grandmother and grandfather, and they were taking care of my grandma who, grandma who had Alzheimer's disease, and I was helping them. And after taking care of her for, for some period of time, I decided to do a series of sculptural pieces about what it's like to live with someone 
and watched them lose their identity through this horrible disease. And I created a series of sculptural pieces and I had a show of those pieces at the Carnegie Center in um, Covington. And kind of an amazing thing happened at that opening. I wrote my artist statement in very plain language about what it's like to see someone you love lose who they are and not be able to um, identify you, their granddaughter, someone that they've always loved. And at that opening, after reading my artist statement and looking at my work, people came up to me and said, I lost someone I love to this terrible disease, or my uncle had dementia, it was terrible. And those people were the ones who ended up buying my work. And that was a huge lesson for me because it really made me understand for the first time the importance of art, the importance of these objects that we make as artists, individuals, and we put those objects out into the world and someone sees them and something about the visual or the shape or the color calls to them because they've had the same shared or common experience and they're drawn to this thing you've made because of your experience as well. So art really is this thing that connects us strangers um, through this object that we've made. And that was a really important lesson for me going on. Um, it made me take what I was doing even a little more seriously. I'm just gonna scroll through some pieces. This is some of my early work. I want you to notice uh, I'm trying to work with color palettes and trying to get better with my brushwork. Um, I had a friend who lived on the Ohio River and there was a big flood in Falmouth, Kentucky years ago and she had to muck out her basement. And I was thinking about how terrible that would be. So I made uh, this lidded jar and you can see at the top of the jar, there's a little house and you can see the, the, the waves coming up all the water. And at that little black uh, line that goes through the jar, it actually says our hopes, our dreams, our personal things floating downstream. And underneath on the bottom of that piece, there's a little painting of Elvis Presley going, hey man, anybody see my guitar? And when you lift open the lid, there's a little painting of Elvis Presley's guitar like floating down the river. Um, I was traveling around the country selling my work and I was at a show in North Carolina when a woman came into my booth and I was telling her about the piece and she's like, you know, my brother actually lived in Falmouth and he lost everything in that flood. I have to get this for him. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. Didn't think anything else of it. And I got a letter from her brother about six months after Christmas um, thanking me for making this piece. He said that he had walked back over his property and was able to salvage just a handful of things that he loved that were important to him. And he said, when I got this jar, I had a place to put these things from the first 55 years of my life. And it just released something in me. So thank you. That was also a pivotal moment for me. It still gets me a little verklempt thinking of it because it made me realize that these objects I was making for my living, my livelihood, with bright color could also have conceptual weight. And that's when I shifted again and decided that I was gonna again go back to Frida Kahlo and say, I'm gonna start documenting my personal history in these brightly colored objects. So whether I was on Weight Watchers and eating lots of fruits and vegetables, or whether I was talking about getting married, cause what? The woman who said she'd never get married, got married to another artist. And um, this is from my series about being married. This is the front on the left and the back on the right. This was thrown on the wheel uh, without a base, squeezed to make an oval shape and then carved in relief and painted with underglaze. Um, I use what I like to call narrative symbolism. It's certainly not a, a phrase that, uh, that I came up with. I'm sure I read it somewhere. That's where I take objects, living things that I think are endlessly fascinating, that I love carving and painting over and over again. And I assign meaning to them. So for me, leaves represent the idea of change because as the leaves fall off the trees, it's a change in the season. Um, I use the color white a lot when I need to talk about being vulnerable because white is the color of surrender. And when you marry someone, you're basically saying, I am willing to be vulnerable to you. I'm gonna go through some of my imagery and the meaning behind them. So on the left is my bookcase from my studio. And on the right is a close-up of some carved books. For me, books represent the idea of communication. As we grow and change as people, we're selecting new adjectives to describe the person we're trying to become. And it's up to us to read each other's pages and for others to read our pages. So as we grow and change, we can move forward together and not grow further apart. 
Uh, on the left is an actual nest, and on the right is my interpretation of a nest. This was thrown on the wheel, trimmed without a base, carved in relief, and then painted with black and white under glaze. Nests for me represent possibilities. On the left is my dog Daisy Doodle and my cat Kitty Carlisle, and on the right is my ceramic interpretation of a dog, a wolf. I use a lot of foxes as well. And these animals represent the idea of being steadfast and true. On the left are pencils and on the right are some ceramic pencils that I make. Those represent the idea of creativity. This is a handmade uh, vessel, slab built. Um, birds for me represent myself and the women in my life. My mom, my sisters, my girlfriends, my professional peers. We are smart. We can survive in any environment. We all sing a different song and we all have different patterns on our feathers. But when the going gets tough, we flock together and help each other. You can see a moon on the right. The moon always represents the idea of great emotion. As I said before, I'm a very emotional person. On the left, you see a star. Stars light the way when things seem dark. And yes, I'm willing to admit I did steal that from Lord of the Rings, but I don't think they'll mind. And there's a branch there. Branches represent the idea of building something. Whenever you see seafaring imagery in my work, that is uh, mapping my artistic journey. Ceramics is 50% art and 50% science. And the science part always, always lets me down. I'm not very sciencey. Um, and so there's always something happening in ceramics because we work with natural materials. There's no guarantee that things are gonna work exactly the same every single time you use them. So you get blown off course when you have cracking or glaze crawls off the surface and you have to do a bunch of testing and try to get yourself back on course. Uh, I am afraid of heights, so whenever I need to express anxiety or doubt or fear, I paint and carve ladders, and, and trees represent the idea of compromise because they are deeply rooted uh, plants that can bend without breaking. For me, snake, snakes represent the idea of forgiveness. Uh, snakes are one of the few animals that have to shed their skin in order to grow, and for me, that's what forgiveness is. It's shedding moments of disappointment or hurt so that you can move forward in your relationships. Rabbits symbolize the idea of strength through endurance. Um, they are these furry little soft creatures, but they can outrun an Arctic fox when they need to. I mean, sometimes they can. Um, let's see here, why is that not moving? Let me, huh. I'm gonna just stop the share for, let me do this really quick. Some, this happened last time too. Let me hit play again, I'm not sure why. Uh, Okay, uh, dragons. Uh, I've had the opportunity to travel to China with some of my work and in researching um, that culture, I found that I was born in the year of the dragon. So whenever I need to remind myself to be fierce and have courage, I paint and carve dragons. People are often, a often ask me like, how do I make my work? How do I get my images? Uh, I've had people say, are they decals? Are they, are they silkscreen? But all of my images are drawn. Um, okay, how's that? That good? Okay. Uh, people are always asking me, how do I get my images to work? Um, are they, are they silk screened? Are they decals? But all of my images are drawn on the surface. Um, because I'm working with clay, and this is going to get a little bit into the science part, you don't want to create dust on the surface of your pieces when you're painting on them. Um, so in order to keep the dust down to a minimum, I have thousands of little images drawn on tracing paper. And as I'm creating my compositions on the surfaces of my pieces, I use these small pieces of paper to transfer images on the surface with a pencil. Hmm. I do not know what's happening here. Can you see it? See that? Okay. Um, so, um, how do I make my work? My work is painted with underglaze, which is a liquid clay. Every layer of underglaze that's painted onto the surface is translucent like watercolor. So I build up many thin layers of underglaze color on the surfaces of my pieces. I paint on work before it's been bisque fired. And this is a, a photo of me painting the surface of my piece. Again, I do not, I'm just gonna have to do it this way. Uh, this is the second thing that I do. So I have a red bowl. I've painted yellow underglaze on the surface to try and block out that dark red uh, color. And now I'm painting white over the surface of that. And you can see the translucent nature of that underglaze. A little bit of that yellow underglaze is coming through the white. 
when I'm doing my blend of underglaze on the surfaces of my pieces, I actually lay out the color from lightest to darkest, and I blend color right on the surface of my piece. Doing that will add another three to six layers of underglaze color onto the surface. And this is what the color blend looks like when it's wet. It's uh, richer and deeper. And after that color dries, you can see that it gets much more pastel. I let my pieces dry for 24 hours before I do any penciling. And this is me just penciling on my design. Next, I start to build up the layers of color on the images, just like I built up the background. I start to lay layers of color on. This is the green going over the yellow. And in this image, you can really see the depth of that underglaze. It's a very thin layer of, of clay that I'm painting on the surface of my piece. Once I get that green on, I'll go back and I'll blend a lighter green and a darker green to get my green blend for my wave. And after I get all my color blended, I go back with a fine line paintbrush. This is weird. This has never happened before. That's all right, Terry. Um, go ahead and start your video once more. Okay. And then we'll try and share again. Okay. Thanks everybody for bearing with us. Okay. I will request for you to start your video once more. Okay. How about that? Okay. Okay, there you are. You want to go ahead and share your screen? Uh, yeah, the problem is uh, my video, my presentation has disappeared. Oh no. Well, that has never you. happened before. Go ahead and find it. it. That is very odd. It's totally fine. Okay. Let's open that up. Yay, technology. Yay. I'm telling you. It's got to keep us all on our toes, right? Well, it's true. I mean, uh, you know, if it's not one thing, it's another. Um, but this is what makes it exciting. Exactly. Everyone's, you know, chewing on their fingers, waiting for your presentation to come I back. I know, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that is just the, the process of working with technology. So, with clay. yeah. Okay. I do not know why it is not opening. There it is. You have your, I think that's the Moorhead one. There's the Ohio Art it's, Speech one. It says Moorhead, but okay. it's, uh, yeah. This is the correct one. Um, I just don't know why it's not uh, opening. Here we go. Let yeah. me let me go down to the appropriate slide. Thanks for bearing with us, folks. Sure. Here we go. Uh, I think I'm right here, and let's hit play. Great. Okay. So. Uh, once I have all the blended color on the surface, I actually would do all my outlining, and that is my uh, fine line brush that I'm outlining all the images with black underglaze. And once I get the outline done, I do a lot of smaller, thinner lines, and I have pieces of paper on my painting table. I dip my pen, uh, my paintbrush in black underglaze, and then I run my paintbrush along that paper until I get the line that I want. And then I start to paint on the surfaces of my pieces. So I've estimated about 30% of the lines that I paint just go right in the garbage, uh, looking for the right line quality. I use a lot of what I call wet black graffito on my pieces. Um, so I paint the black underglaze on in a small section about the size of a dime. And while the black underglaze is wet, I carve through to pick up the background color. Uh, this allows me to get really fine dots and lines. And this is what the piece actually looks like when it's all painted but has not been fired yet in the kiln. And after it's bisque fired and the clear glaze is applied, this is what the piece looks like. So you can see that it goes through quite a big color change. So part of the thing that, that I, you have to keep in mind when you work with underglaze is as you're painting, you're imagining what the finished piece looks like, not what's right in front of you. I wanted to show you one of my pieces in the round. For those of you who aren't familiar with my work, I don't really think of my pieces as having a front and a back per se. I carry the story on throughout the exterior of the entire piece. I like to do painting on the interiors and also painting on the bottom. Um, because I am dedicated to my art, um, I told you earlier that I had done some, um, or maybe I haven't told you yet. Um, I've been involved in five international artist collaborations. I've traveled to Germany and France and China. Um, I've had my work exhibited in Cuba and Japan. And three weeks after I got married, 
I went to Germany for an art exchange and to show and sell some of my work. Um, I did a series, remember I had talked about taking my, my personal experiences and painting them on my, my brightly colored pieces to sell. After I got married, I did a series called Sometimes I Feel Like a Natural Disaster because my husband and I didn't live together before we got married and it was a first marriage for us both. So there was uh, some bumpy times and this was purchased by a collector in Germany. Uh, because that collaboration went really well, when they did another collaboration, they asked me to uh, participate. This one was a drawing collaboration. And again, I think it's so important to get out of your main media and to work in different media. So this was a collaboration with artists from Cincinnati and Munich in Germany. So on the left, you see a drawing by an artist in Germany. All the artists in Cincinnati got copies of an original drawing, and we had to take that drawing and transform it into a new drawing. It's called a redrawing project. So on the right, you see my interpretation of that German artist drawing. That led to a local author saying, hey, I'd love for you to illustrate the cover of my next book of poems. And so I was able to do an illustration on a ceramic tile based on one of his poems, and that became the cover of his book. So, you know, I'm not, I, could I paint it in acrylics? Absolutely not, but doesn't mean you can't take a picture of a ceramic piece and put it on a book cover. That same writer said, I would love for you and your husband, my husband's a printmaker, to do a print of a short story, and we call those broadsides. So I did some illustrations, and this time I thought, why not try something different? And this is done in Scratchboard, again, um, something new, but again, I think it's so important to get out of your comfort zone, zone and learn something new. This is another illustration that I did for that, and if you look at the left side of this illustration, I turned this one into a ceramic piece, and it's illustrating the sentence, she made her night bed in the branches. Um, I had a young writer come to me who had just graduated from college and he's like, you know, I, I love your work. I would love to shadow you for a week and just interview you and write a piece about you. And I was like, oh my God, I have this big show coming up. I don't have any time. And then I thought about my friend, Joyce Clancy, who gave me the opportunity uh, to do something with her. And I was like, you know, you got to pay it forward. So I was like, sure, come spend the week with me. And so we spent the week together. He wrote an article. I read it. It was really great. And then I never heard anything from him again. A year later, however, I was contacted by Clay Times and they said, hey, we've just got an article submitted about you. We'd love to put you on the cover. Does that sound OK? And I was like, yes, it does. So again, that idea that not only do people present opportunities for you, but you need to do the same and present opportunities for other people because you never know how those opportunities will come back around and help you later on. Um, I had the uh, another opportunity to travel to France. This time, a group of Cincinnati ceramic artists uh, worked with a group of French artists who all uh, worked in ceramics in Nancy. And we planned for a year to do an exhibition together. We traveled to France, had an exhibition, and then they came back to the States and stayed in Cincinnati for a fellow exhibition. Um, and in that experience of preparing for the show for a year, I took French lessons for a year. I traveled internationally again, which freaks me out because I like to be in control. And when you go to a country where they don't speak your language, you know, you don't have control over everything. And I did this 19 inch bowl, it's carved in relief and then painted. It's about six inches deep. And I try very hard to pick titles for my work that allows the viewer to have an opening into what it is that I'm trying to talk about. And so the title of this piece is called My Year of Living Dangerously. And I was uh, had a show, it's just a little Christmas show where everybody had a table and I had this piece up for sale. I, I had just gotten it out of the kiln. It was $3,600. I had to run out to get something and come back. And when I came back into the room, it got kind of quiet. And I looked over at my table and this piece was missing. And I was like, oh my God, someone broke my piece. I walked up to the cashier's table and I was like, where is my piece? And they said, well, shortly after you left, a woman came in, she looked around, she walked up to your piece, she read the title, she picked it up, she walked over and she bought it. And I called her later, we actually never met in person. And I said, what was it? And she said, my family had a dangerous year too and the title spoke to me. So it's so important as artists that when we're titling our work, we give the viewer a clue of what our idea is. Now they don't have to you know, come to the same conclusions as you, but you never know when that is gonna strike someone. Again, these objects we make are forms of communication. 
Um, I did have an opportunity. I worked with the Rookwood Pottery Company for a couple of years. I designed work for them um, uh, and had the experience of working as part of a collective. And after about two years, we decided to part ways. And uh, I had been asked by the Canton Museum of Art, which is a museum in Canton, Ohio, that collects American works on paper and American ceramics, if I would be willing to do a one-person show. And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, so after I quit my job at Rookwood, I started working on pieces for that show, and I opened up my first kiln load of work, uh, and this is what happened. Uh, while I had been working at Rookwood, and again, I'm going to get a little sciencey here, the, the talc is a main component of earthenware, which is my clay body of choice. They closed a mine on the East Coast and opened up a new mine in, on, in, in Texas, and the molecules were shaped differently. I was using my old underglaze with new with this new clay body, and they were incompatible. Um, later that day, I got a call um, about my friend Joyce uh, saying that she had passed away. Um, I used to bring Joyce to my studio every couple of months to make stuff in clay. We were still very close. I kind of took care of her uh, with her family towards the end of her life, and that was the second shock that I had that day. So when I called the clay companies later to say, what is happening? They're like, whatever it is, it's not our fault. And I was like, I just bought a thousand pounds of this clay. I have this big museum show. What can I do? What low fire clay body do you have that doesn't have talc in it? And they said, we're at earthenware. And they said, we'll trade you the clay. And we recommend that you buy all new underglazes and throw out your old ones. And so that's what I did. But instead of buying the bright, oranges and purples and greens, I bought the colors that I was feeling. Um, not only was I mourning the loss of my friend Joyce, uh, my mentor in many ways, I was mourning the loss of my confidence in my ceramic abilities because of this huge uh, disaster that I opened the kiln to. And to this day, when I open the kiln, instead of being like, oh my God, I'm so excited, I have anxiety. And sometimes I just don't even want to open the kiln you know, that that's just life, things stick with you. The other thing that I was afraid of is going from these very bright colors to this very, very much more muted palette. I didn't know if any of this work would sell, um, but I sold it all um, because people who came to the show had lost someone that they loved and they really connected with that feeling of, of mourning and loss. I also started to experiment with matte glazes, um, trying to play with the idea of what happens if you get rid of the black line or use it sparingly. And I had a lot of success with these uh, kind of more painterly pieces, had a show, sold everything from that show. And then I found out that the company who made those matte glazes didn't sell enough, so they stopped making them. So again, in ceramics, you have to reinvent yourself all the time. Um, and one of the things that I did to reinvent myself was to create a small uh, fund uh, where I take some of my income when I can and I give small grants uh, to ceramics departments to buy materials and supplies. Uh, I'm going to just talk a little bit fast. I've got about uh, seven more minutes of slides to get through. Um, another uh, international collaboration, the Chinese artist image on the left and my interpretation on the right. I went to, tra to China. I traveled there and was so in love with the artistry and the art that I found there and had a huge impact on my work. You can see that my, my forms are really influenced by those paper cuts. Um, I started to bring soft colors back into my palette. Again, these dragons. Uh, you can see that the foliage in my trees are these very soft kind of lotus shapes that I saw in a lot of uh, Chinese artwork. So again, you know, you have to open yourself up to be influenced by things. I'm a workaholic, <laughs> enough said about that. Uh, I love to make sculpture and all this time I'm making work and selling it, but I do love to make sculpture. And whenever I want to make sculpture, I ride away for grants. And I got a grant from the city of Cincinnati. I'm going to go through these pieces. This, this body of work is about trying to balance my studio life with my family life, with my community life. All these pieces come apart. Uh, the bird lifts off. This piece is called balance. Truce caught. Now the ladders of this piece come out and the bird just balances. So this is four separate pieces that fit together. Lesson. On the left is relentless and on the right is precious. These are small wall pieces. This piece is called bait and it has 50 miniature clay books uh, that are in the center and then the nest is made out of carved ladders. Try. Refuge. 
momentum. Along with that grant, my friend Nancy Hopkins and I started a program called Art in Action. It was a short program, it lasted for six months and we got artists in our studio building to give away one free class or one art experience a month for six months. Our theme was create, educate, participate, motivate. And these are some of the pictures of people who came into my studio while I had that grant. They would make a book for themselves and give a book to me. And down at City Hall, there's a big nest, ceramic mess, and it's got 300 individual clay books made by citizens of Cincinnati as part of this grant. Again, I really believe in giving back to the community. This is the kind of work I was doing, some color seeping back in, um, but it is a more muted palette. And then uh, I got a new batch of clay and the underglaze on this piece uh, broke off after it came out of the glaze kiln. So I had to once again, start experimenting. That is ceramics. You cannot count on it uh, necessarily. And because I couldn't make and sell anything, I applied to artworks to create 20 mixed media paintings for the Ronald McDonald House in Cincinnati. I got the job and then I hired a painter to teach me how to use acrylics and how to do mixed media work. So again, jumping in and figuring it out on the fly. And these are some of the pieces that were made by 13 high school students, three uh, teaching artists and myself. And these hang in the Ronald McDonald House in Cincinnati. And the backgrounds were painted by the students. They did the horses, the leaves, the moons. Uh, on paper, we cut those pieces of paper out and adhere them to the surface of the piece. This is a 30 by 40 piece. Um, after that happened, I was asked to take care of my aunt who lived in New Jersey. Um, she needed to sell her house and move into a nursing home. So I started to create a series of small sculptures about what it's like to leave your life to help someone else um, with their life. And so I started to create these series of cages. The cages are built of love and compassion and responsibility and empathy. And you go into that cage with that person that you love and you look through the bars of the cage at life that just keeps moving on without you while you help this person that you love because you don't want to live with regret. Um, these pieces are all thrown on the wheel and then carved in relief. Um, you notice the color palette is once again that muted palette. If you look at these trees, they come together and almost create ladders because it was a really scary time. Scared for them, scared for myself, um, trying to make sure that our, our relationship um, could keep moving forward in a positive way. This piece is called Solace. After that series of pieces, um, I was approached by um, uh, the city of Cincinnati. They needed four ceramic artists to create um, ceramic lanterns for a park in China. Uh, Lan Tan Park, uh, also known as Friendship Park, they wanted three Chinese artists and three artists from, uh, four artists from Cincinnati to create these lanterns. They gave each artist an animal and a color. So my animal was the phoenix and my color was ruby. So this is the front of the piece and this is the phoenix flying over the park. This is the side and you can see the tail feathers of the phoenix as they come down along the side of the piece. This is the back of the piece. Again, you can see those kind of lotusy clouds and there's a body of a dragon on the bottom. And as we come around to the other side, you can see the dragon's head. He's blowing out fire and that is the wind that the Phoenix is flying on. These pieces had to fit into a piece of luggage. So they were 19 inches high by 12 inches wide by eight inches deep. So now I have that on permanent display in this park. Um, that led to a whole series of pieces of making my own sculptures. And that led to the pandemic. Um, I remember when that happened and they shut everything down. I was listening to the governor's um, press conferences every day. And because I had moved my studio to my house, I was painting dragons because I was afraid and I was trying to tell myself to be strong and keep making work. And that's when I found out about the Ohio Art Speak and Instagram page. And this is the piece that I submitted for the page. And it's a piece that's in the exhibition. Um, I had to totally reimagine my business model. So I decided to do some online teaching. I used the $4,000 in PPP money that I got. And I hired the guy who designed my website, Michael Schmidt, to help me wrap technology around my teaching ideas. And I created my own online teaching um, uh, portal, if you will, on my website. We're working on terrykernclasses.com where you'll be able to take live classes or get classes on demand. And one of the thing I love about teaching is it's again, building community. 
Um, through the pandemic, uh, I lost my mother and father-in-law right before. My dad died in 2020 on Thanksgiving in the pandemic, and now I'm taking care of my mom who has um, early stage dementia. And you can see on the right, when I have these emotional things happen, all the color seeps out of my work and I keep it very simple. Um, but there's always a chance for hope. And now I'm doing a series about my mom who I can remember sewing late into the night, sewing our Halloween costumes, darning socks. And now my sisters and I are like this little group of birds helping her sew together her memories. Uh, these are two pieces that are actually in the show. Excuse me surprisingly emotional. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to go to the show, you should check it out because it's a really beautifully curated show and shows how everybody responded to the pandemic. And this is um, how I responded. For those of you who have never seen my work in person, I paint the bottoms of all my pieces as well because I believe in the three-dimensional surface, every part of my piece is important. And this is where I'm gonna end up. I just wanted to let you know that you can go to my website, terrykern.com. You can follow my work in progress on Instagram or, or Facebook. I've got a little YouTube channel. Um, I'm working on my classes um, uh, website and you can come to my studio on final Friday at the Pendleton Art Center uh, to visit my studio on the final Friday of every month. So um, I guess that's all I've got. I'm gonna stop the share. Here, that was phenomenal. Great. Great. It was so great. I totally got choked up too. So thank you. Share, shared emotion here. Yes. What can so, I say? Yeah. If you have questions, pop them into the chat. We'll get to them. Um, you, we had a comment from a fellow artist who's also in the show. Uh, Linda McClanahan early on said, so great to hear from other artists. Perhaps art is another way of talking, maybe an older, more truthful way. And also said such marvelous Highly skilled work. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I agree on all points there. Um, there is something really kind of special about your more um, utilitarian works of art. So clay is very approachable, right? The same way that fiber is. They're, they're, they have a toe in um, craft and fine art. And so I would love for you to chat a little bit about what um, what that feels like for you and the importance of that kind of slight difference, right? Because it, it is different. It is different. Um, it's very interesting. I remember in school, the big talk about functional art versus actual art. And I'm like, it's all art. Um, all the art is made by hands, whether you're painting on a canvas, or throwing on the wheel, or you know, stitching a piece of embroidery, or banging out a ring on a on your silversmith, um, you know, equipment, whatever that's called. I've never made jewelry, but I want to. Um, I think that is the thing. the The thing that I think that makes clay unique, and why it really speaks to me, is the idea that you're making a piece of art that also functions. Um, when I was making mugs. I knew as I made those mugs, as I put a little piece of material over the lip of the mug, that that lip was going to be touching someone's lips every morning. So I wanted to feel soft and supple. You know, I wanted them to feel when they opened their cupboard and they got their favorite Terry Kern mug out that had the bright colors that it just changed the tone of their day. If they had a bad night's sleep, they're like, oh, I love this mug you know, because it's got a little painting on the bottom or it had something on the side or a little funny thing about like, you know, caffeine being the number one most important drug in the world because it's how I start my day too. Um, so I think there is um, a certain beauty in being able to make something that people can actually use and being able to put into that piece your sense of humor, your love of craft. Uh, one of the things that I often say is time in my studio is time away from all the other people and things that I love, my husband, my family, my dog, my garden. So I want the pieces that I make to be museum quality work. Um, and whenever you're making something that could be put in a museum because of your level of craft, to me that there is no difference. It's just a different kind of material, but it's all art. I hope that answers your question. Absolutely, absolutely. We have a question from Chuck. 
You spoke about the importance of experimenting as an artist and trying work to work in different media or different forms. How will you next be experimenting and or challenging yourself as an artist? I believe the next thing I'm going to be doing is working in printmaking. Um, I, my husband is a printmaker. We've got a letterpress at our house and I dream of doing a series of prints. Um, the more detailed my work gets, the more it reminds me of a print, all the little lines in the backgrounds of some of my pieces, that line work just to me feels like it would make a perfect little print. It would make a great card or you know something that someone could hang in their house somewhere just a little tiny moment of art of creativity of communication of connection so i think printmaking is the next thing that i'm going to try i, I will be honest i dropped the only printmaking class i ever took in graduate school i took an etching class and it was so technique heavy that i was like i can't do two technique heavy art forms at the same time so it's something that i definitely want to get back into and i, I would say it's printmaking yeah that's exciting um so and Sika is coming to Cincinnati. And for those that don't know what that is, it's the National Clay Conference. It happens annually and it moves all across the country. Um, you and your studio will have quite a bit going on. You also are demonstrating at the conference, which is super special. If you all are not familiar with Nsika, go ahead and look that up online. Uh, it's the uh, acronym is N-C-E-C-A. Um, and if you pop that into your web browser, you'll be able to find all sorts of information on that. So congratulations on being so involved in that. I'm excited to see that all come to fruition. Um, Terry, when you are inspired today by artists, what is it that's currently pulling you in? Like who's really wowing you right now? Well, this is kind of interesting. Um, you know, all people are interesting and, and I have my own little things. Um, I mostly look to history to be inspired. I have a thousand ideas in my head, like all artists. And if I see another artist doing something that I have an idea that I want to do, I'm like, oh, I can't do it now. Someone's already doing it. So even though that I know, like, in general, that all artists are doing all kinds of things similar to what I want to do. If I don't know someone's doing it, I feel free to explore that. So I don't tend to look at a lot of contemporary ceramics because then I'm like, dang. And even though I know it's kind of ridiculous, it just is kind of how I feel. Um, so I would say that when I look at art, I tend to look at things that are highly detailed, um, that have a narrative quality about them. Uh, and things that are very finely crafted, whether it's a painting or a print or a piece of ceramics. Um, I just, it's just kind of my little thing. I would like to say, um, I did just go to the Canton Museum. They have a beautiful show there and it's all ceramic sculptures of animals. Now I can't remember anyone's name, but I saw some amazing uh, ceramic sculpture of animals um, and it just blows me away. And again, the things that I was most attracted to were the things that had lots of tiny little compulsive details uh, that had this beautiful narrative quality and the things that were beautifully crafted. Um, so whether, you know, um, that that's what I would say. That's that's kind of my answer. And if anybody is going to Inseca, I will be in booth 120 on Thursday and Friday morning, first thing doing demos. All right. So uh, last question. What has it meant to be part of the Art Speaking of Light exhibition to you? I have to tell you, it's been a great honor. Um, and it's meant a lot knowing that I think there were 400 people like this community of artists during the pandemic. We were all listening to those press conferences. We were all still figuring out a way to make work, even though shows were shut down, galleries weren't open. It just made me feel connected to this broader community of artists in Ohio. And when you go to the show, the depth and breadth of quality and media and uh, the way that people, the other artists express themselves is going to blow your mind. So it felt uh, really wonderful, wonderful to be um, considered uh, to be one of the artists that they wanted to showcase along with the other 16 artists in the show. It, it was a great honor and I'm, I'm, um, you know, words fail me a little bit. It was wonderful. 
Well, we are certainly absolutely thrilled to have you as a part of the exhibition. Um, you know, every artist that's within the show is a key note to that harmony. Um, so with that, I think it's a great place for us to end. Terry, thank you so much for the generosity of your time and talents. This has been phenomenal. Uh, big thank you to the Ohio Arts Council's board, the governor and the legislature for supporting the Ohio Arts Council, this great space, obviously, and of course, Ohio artists. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.